Hello again with Tasco, and we are back for part two of Tyler Gandam for Mayor's interview. Hello, Tyler. It's, hey, it's nice to see you again. Dude, it feels like it was just like we were just together. It's amazing. Like it's been a week later, and we're I'm wearing the same clothes. You're wearing the same clothes. Everybody wears the same clothes all the time. <laughs> anyway, just joking. Very low budget war group. <laughs> there you go. There you go. It's all Zoom Zoom cloth clothing. <laughs> anyway, thank you for joining me for part two, uh, Tyler. We're gonna get right into it uh, right away. Here we're gonna talk a little bit about taxes and the economy. And um, I know that uh, you've been on council for the last eight years, and um, the taxes have been what they've been but what's your plan to keep them uh low or the same or or do you want to raise them what's going on with taxes no i think we've done a really good job of the levels of service we're reviewing those regularly uh last year for our 2020 budget uh we decreased taxes just about two and a half percent for the 2021 budget we kept it at zero percent so i think this council's done a really good job of being fiscally responsible making sure that we're going after the needs and not so much the wants. It's not as much fun, but we've heard for a long time that people feel taxes are too high here and we need to address that. So we're gonna go through a a time of maybe not getting all of the fun things that we'd like to have, but we're going to continue to maintain that fiscal responsibility, holding taxes as low as we possibly can, decreasing when we can, and really just going after what we need to fix in the community. Right. Good. Do you think that uh, Wetaskiwin um, spends its tax money appropriately? Like, so that I guess that would be up to the city manager and the departments. But do you feel there's any kind of um, uh, any anything not better, but a different way that things could be done to save money with the management of our tax money? Yeah, for sure. And so that all comes down to the budgeting process. Council decides the budget where the which department's getting how much money. Uh, the departments will come and present to council saying this is what we need and why. And then council's making the decisions on whether that's something that they support, they don't, or whether or not we can do something differently to try to find those efficiencies. So yes, I think the council is spending tax money appropriately. I think that we can continue to find um, efficiencies throughout that. And a big part of that is through our budget consultation. So when we do surveys with the public, uh, pre-COVID, we were able to meet and we'd go through what we were proposing for a budget. Um, people have the opportunity to say, yes, that's great. No, that's not. Why are we doing that? You guys are crazy. Um, so public input is a big part of what we do with that budget. And I, I'd like to see that continue. I don't know what it's going to look like um, as we're going through the fourth wave, the fourth wave of COVID, uh, but we'll definitely have the online surveys and the online consultation. And of course, just getting in touch with your member of council or any member of council um, and finding out what's going on. So if a, if a mayor as yourself wants to, say, um, save tax money by cutting services to some degree, for example, the recycling center's hours were closed Mondays and Tuesdays, whereas before they were open, uh, the, the landfill, I think, is the same way. Um, other services maybe, uh, again, can be, can be altered. How do you, as a, a mayor, determine what gets cut as far as services go? So I don't, I don't determine what gets cut. If I want to see a change in the level of service, then I propose that to administration and council. And then I need three other members of council to agree with me, especially when we're going through the budget consultation. So it's the majority of council that will decide how things are getting spent or how things are, aren't being spent. I think there's a little bit of a misconception that the mayor kind of decides everything that goes on. Uh, <laughs> thankfully, it's not. Uh, it's myself and three members of council that vote on something, and that's how the change happens. So right. for for any member on council, and, it, and you don't have to be the mayor. I don't have to be the one saying, I want to change the level of service for uh, snow clearing. Any member of council can bring that forward, discuss that with administration, and then we have a vote on it as a council. And if four members of council are voting that way, then... That's the change that happens. So, and how does that get um, calculated? Like, how do you know, um, or how would you find out uh, how, uh, like, say, for example, snow removal? Say, you know, you see the guy going by your street like a whole bunch of times and it's just recently snowed, and then you may not see him for a long time. Is it something that you as a mayor would uh, contact the city manager and say, hey, can you look into this? Or is that left up to the city manager to make all those decisions? Like, how does that work? So council sets the policy on snow clearing, right? So we've got a policy. This is when a a truck's going out. This is when the grader's going out to do the clearing. 
Uh, so administration follows that policy. If council wants to see a change in that policy, they think that it's happening too often or it's not happening enough. Or if we're hearing from the residents that it's not happening enough or it's happening too often, that's then when we can take it back, review the policy. And if we need to make a change to the policy, again, four members of council vote in favor of that. And that's the change to the policy. Right. So pretty much everything that the city does is policy driven. And that's a big part of what council's role is as governance is to to create policy, change policy. And that's how the city is going to be operated. So do you ever have uh, thoughts to yourself um, about how what things you want to investigate or look at cutting to save tax money? Or is that something that you're in is in your head all the time? Or is it? Okay, all right. And and not only Yeah, not only in my head, but it's what I'm hearing from residents too, right? Okay, so is there anything currently that you think that we should be cutting back on to save a little bit more tax money or to use towards something else? I, and so personally, I don't think so. I think where our levels of service are, are pretty good. Yeah. There's always going to be tweaks to make things better and to find some efficiencies. Uh, I think the biggest thing is, is I haven't heard from residents that they want less service. Right. That everybody, like they want to pay less taxes, but they don't want any less service. Does, right? Doesn't so less it, taxes mean less service though? I think. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so just, yeah, exactly. just, just assume they mean that. And then like, you know, yeah. there you go. <laughs> yeah, just kidding. <laughs> Um, all right. So, um, we're talking about, uh, services. So is there any services that, um, that, that I obviously, uh, watching the last council meetings, you can see who votes for uh, different things in our community, who wants things to happen uh, on certain aspects or things. Is there anything, um, that you have going forward besides the things that you're uh, already pushing, trying to push through or suggest, or, you know, that you're in favor of, um, that you'd like to add as far as services go. Is there anything you want to bring with Haskell that we don't have now that you think would be really good or that you're going to try to some, uh, some examples on the different forums I've seen would be, uh, transportation, you know, whether it's, you know, between communities or whether it's better transportation for seniors in Wetaskiwin, uh, things like uh, youth programs or something that we don't have that you would like to implement as a service to our citizens. Yeah. And so I hear that often too. And same with curbside pickup for recycling. I hear, I hear lots of um, requests for that. But again, if when we're adding another service or we're changing a level of service, it's going to increase the taxes. So while it would be really nice to have that curbside pickup for recycling, we've got a great recycling depot that gets used really, really well. Um, the transit is another good option or a good example. Just after I got elected as mayor, that was something that I had um, investigated pretty thoroughly. There's an on-demand transit system that Cochrane is using. So it uses virtual bus stops throughout the city. You really don't have to set up any of the infrastructure. Um, you can lease the buses. You set the rate for what the fare is going to be. And then you decide how much you're going to subsidize that transit within the community. And while I think that would be amazing to have, I hear way more often that I don't want to pay more in taxes or I want to pay less in taxes than I do. I want more transit. So right. it's going to be, it's, it's that balancing act of trying to find what the community really needs and trying to find that balance of hopefully reducing taxes, but at the very least keeping them the same. Sure. Um, next question we're going to talk a little bit about is economic development um, or business bringing, bringing business to a task when uh, over the past many, many years, we've seen downtown with lots of vacant buildings. We've seen a lot of vacant buildings throughout with task when, and it seems like we can never get we can never get like uh, more like there's stuff that opens up like the new development by the water tower that's got stuff in it it's new buildings that are full but yeah. there's still a lot of old uh, buildings and bringing in um, new businesses would be uh, good for taxes because they pay a little bit higher tax rate and the more we can build and have then the less overall tax burden that the community has plus the more jobs and everything else so yeah. uh, why can't we seem to get the ball rolling what what are you going to try to do to make you know, this happen in this four year term. Yeah. So on existing buildings right now, the city had a facade grant that we put out, um, whether it was a new awning, new signage, whatever they were going to do up front to try to uh, spruce up the property that they have to try to attract the business to, to their um, vacant building or to their, to their property. Uh, and then with the uh, introduction of bill seven from the pro provincial government, having that tax incentive for, New, new builds, like with a new business or a new development, um, or existing, but doing an addition or adding on to what's there already. So we have the ability now to 
um, offer a little bit of a property tax incentive over a set number of years to encourage that kind of development. So I think that that's going to be something that will play well for the city of Wetaskiwin. Did that just start little, or has that been going on for a while? When did that? Uh, it's re- relatively new. Like within the last year, there was a new a new bill passed by the provincial government. So we had passed the policy on that um, to make that happen. So now it's just a matter of advertising that. And council over the last few years has a real priority with economic development. Uh, we got out of Jedi. So the money we we're paying into Jedi for our annual fees we put back into economic development strictly for the city. And now we've got two fantastic uh, people in that department that are aggressively trying to find um, value added services for the community, finding out how uh, exist- existing business can grow and expand. And if you're looking for growth in a community, you get about 80% growth from existing business and 20% from coming from outside the community. Mm-hmm. So we have a real focus on what we've got existing making sure that they've got everything that they need and encouraging them when we can and offering them, obviously the city supports when we can too. So it's economic development is a kind of a marathon and it's just something that every once in a while you get to see the fruits of your labor, but you've been busting your butt for years to get where you're at. Yeah. So it's nice to see. And it's nice to see the the progression from council on offering that type, those types of things like the business grants. Uh, one of them was, is that uh, we partnered with the chamber. So we offered, accounting and uh, legal services Hmm. to make sure that businesses were applying for all of the COVID relief grants that were available, both provincially and federally. So offering as much support to our local businesses as we can, and hopefully showing other businesses or potential businesses and developers that see a city that supports it the way that we do, that this is a good place to come as well and, and bring their investment. All right. Um, tell us a little, t- Tyler, tell us a little bit about uh, local pre- procurement or procurement. I always say that wrong. Um, when it comes to um, city service, cities needing things done like concrete work and pavement and yep. uh, that kind of stuff. Um, like if you get two quotes for a project and one is from an out of town company that's lower because they're maybe a bigger company, um, maybe they pay less taxes in their community, whatever. And then you receive a quote from a local business that could be higher. Is there any sort of policy or do you want to see any sort of policy change based on um, supporting giving more money even though it's more expensive to our local businesses it so it's a it's a fine balance council doesn't generally pick who wins the the tender or the bids right so administration does that we have a scoring process that we have to do and we're legislated on how we can award those tenders so we have to be really careful on how we're awarding those two like we have to be justified and who we're awarding that bid to and it's not always lowest cost. That's a part of the bid process, but it's not. that's not in its entirety. Our administration has done a really good job of making sure that they're available, especially to our local contractors, so that they can be successful when they're, when they're bidding on local jobs. We'd love to see all of our local work or all of the work here in the city go to local contractors. It's just that we're legislated on how we award those tenders, and we just have to be careful with that as well. But I know that our city manager has made herself available to uh, local contractors to help them put together bids so that they're successful or have a better chance of being successful while we're still following the legislation on how we award those bids. All right. Interesting. Good stuff. All right. We're going to move on into um, crime and homelessness. Uh, Tyler, what do you think, uh, which crime impacts Wetaskiwin the most? And I guess you can have your opinion on what impact means. Um, and do you have a specific plan to deal with that uh, most type of crime uh, sure. that impacts us? I think that I think there's two crimes that impact our city the most. It's persons, like crimes against persons, and then property crime. Uh, tons of theft, theft under five thousand dollars. All of those little things that go on continuously within the community is a big part of why our crime severity index, especially the persons crimes, right? Why our crime severity index is so high, uh, which is why uh, about a year and a half ago I reached out to the Minister of Justice. At the time, it was Minister Schweitzer saying our crime severity index is like two and a half times the provincial average. Our members are responding two times the criminal code calls for service of the provincial average. Like we need help. Something we've added members over the last couple of years and it's just, we're not making a dent in it at all. So uh, that was right at the start of COVID. Wasn't able to get a meeting with him. He changed ministries. Uh, Minister Madhu came in and then was the minister of justice. I reached out to him immediately as as well. Uh, Told him, all of the issues that we're having, the, the 
the need for support from the provincial government. And um, so we were sitting in a, a committee room, had the inspector with us, all of council, my administration. And I said, like, we need help. And I, he said, what do you need? I said, send me, 10, send me 10 RCMP officers so that we can start looking after the call volume to begin with and looking after member fatigue and member burnout, send me 10 members and then we'll get we'll get rolling on our crime severity index and they can be more proactive. Inspector Duran said established a crime reduction unit that he would have to break apart every once in a while because we were short on members on the regular watch. With the 10 additional members, we would be able to keep that crime reduction unit together. They could be way more proactive. Their investigations were way more thorough. Um, they were able to keep an eye on the prolific offenders uh, he got back to me about two months later um, in a phone conversation or a, a phone meeting. And as he was going on, it made it sound like he was going to let us hire 10 more RCMP members because we're a 70-30 split, right? With a population of under 15,000 people, we pay 70% and the federal government coughs up or uh, pays 30%. What would so it, he was making it sound- Don't be interrupt you, but what would it be if we were over 15,000? What would happen? 90. 90%. So if we, if our population grows over 15,000 people, our bill to the RCMP climbs 20% just because of that. Hmm, that's there's, a- there's no extra, there's no extra members. There's no extra resources. You get over 15,000 people and your, your split for RCMP cost is now 90%. And what's our number now? 70. No, our percent yeah, people. How many people in Wetaska? Oh, uh, we're right around the federal census will be done soon. I think we're right around 13,000 people. All right. So a couple more thousand. We, so it shouldn't something we have to worry about in the near near future anyways. Not in the near future, but something to be conscious of as we, now, as we work towards that too, right? Now, not that I want people to leave Wetaskiwin, but and just, <laughs> and just because we're talking, what's the number to get more funding if we have less people? So 15,000 people give us, no, it's, it's 30, oh, 70, I, 30. It's not, you they, know. <laughs> they, they changed the police funding model where uh, towns and cities under 5,000 were weren't paying for RCMP. Oh, I see. So, Anyways, so, I mean, I'm, whole, that's, that's I'm just, whole I'm just making stuff. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm not suggesting that we only have 5,000 people in Wetaskiwin, but uh, it's just an interesting question that pops into my head. Sorry, randomness. Don't didn't mean to interrupt you from your awesome response. That's okay. Uh, so, long, and I was going to say long story short, but I think it's too late. We're long story long. Um, Minister Madhu uh, provided us with a $5.1 million grant mm-hmm. for 10 RCMP members over three years. So we've filled seven out of the 10 positions currently uh, and the last three won't be far behind and that'll have a huge impact on the calls for service the level of service should go up with our rcmp the quality of investigations will go up the ability to manage the detachment will be that much easier uh, and and morale will change as well like i couldn't imagine being an rcmp member and going to a place that is under the provincial average and making a, a salary or doing twice the work working in Wetaskiwin and making the same salary. So that should make a difference in our recruitment and retention as, as well. Uh, way less member burnout and just that morale, like I said, within the, deta- in the, within the detachment. So if we have seven new members currently, um, do you feel that our level of service and our response time has gotten better? Like, have you been getting any reports from the constable to tell us how those numbers would be? We, ju- we just had our update on Monday from council and it wasn't on response times, but as, as those positions get filled, our level of service absolutely will increase. What would it take to get um, a dispatch out of Wetaskiwin instead of Red Deer? What, why is that such a hard thing to do? I'm just a random question or maybe, but. Cost. So if they've got centralized dispatch, so Red Deer will dispatch a number of, deta- a number of detachments instead of each detachment dispatching themselves so now you've got all of that overhead the call center all of the staff it's yeah so does it's, what, it's a cost does what task would have to pay then a little bit of money to the red deer dispatch to have them dispatch us or how does that it's, work it's all part of our rcmp oh, service i see okay um uh so so we have three more left to hire for the uh, 10 people for three years what happens after three years with these 10 police officers uh, Minister Madhu said that he'll be keeping an eye on it. So he's really interested in the impact that these 10 members are going to have with Wetaskiwin. So he's going to reassess or the provincial government will reassess after that three years. If it's had an impact and things are changing, then we can make the case that we need to continue on with this grant. 
And if it's not, then do we increase the members? Do we like, what, di- what, what do we need to do differently to have that kind of effect on our crime severity index? Is there a possibility that during the next term that um, the grant won't happen and then we're stuck paying uh, for, for 10 extra members? Or would you no, not? We, no? Like, we, no, we pay for mm-hmm. we pay for the members that we've hired that we're contracted for and we've got a grant. I mean, the province can pull the grant at any time, but that means that the members go away. We won't be mm-hmm. paying for the members unless the, council, unless the council of the day decides that they want to pay for those additional members. Right. Okay, great. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, reducing uh, the loitering and the panhandling and the public intoxication. I know that we've had a history of all three of those things in our community for several years. Do you have any specific plans on how we can further reduce or like what's what's how, how do we handle the situation? What do you think going forward? Yeah. So while I don't think that we can police our way out of it, I think the additional members are going to help with that, too. Uh, the patrols would be increased. So being able to keep an eye on that a little bit better is going to make a difference. And then also continuing to work with community services, like with the provincial ministries, mental health and addictions, community services, um, having our FCSS involved as well, and making sure that those supports are in place for mental health addictions. Um, and then following that up with, through the Minister of Justice, making sure that our justice system is looking after it as well. Because while, again, I don't think that we can police our way out of it, it's definitely a big part of why we're getting some getting some of the holes not being filled in terms of homelessness, panhandling, uh, public intoxication. But a big part of that still is the mental health and addictions. And if we're not going to address that, then we're going to continue to have those problems. Sure. The uh, bylaw that Wetaskiwin has, how many officers do we have through bylaw? Four, I believe. And those are Four, a- possibly five, yeah. And those are 100% paid for by the city, correct? By the municipality, yeah. All right. So um, do we have enough of those uh, types of uh, people? Like, would, would adding a couple more of those? And um, I, I mean, obviously, we... It's just another question in my mind. Um, if we lower yeah. a couple cops and hire four bylaw, uh, would we get a better result for our money? Like, do we? Is that something that you guys think about or you think about all the time? Yeah, and that's why we added another bylaw or a peace officer. Um, I don't know if it was this last year in our budget cycle or the year before, but trying to offset that. So some of the calls for service that our RCMP are, are receiving, our bylaw could be looking after too. So again, just finding that balance of who's better equipped to look after that. Hmm. And where are we getting the biggest bang for our buck, right? So whether it's a CPO that can do a few things, whether it's city bylaws, uh, a little bit of traffic enforcement, and then if there's that public in talks, which is kind of a gray area between RCMP and CPO, just trying to find that balance. All right. Um, we talked to you, you spoke a little bit about the uh, homelessness situation in Wetaskiwin or the, the people that are homeless. Um, being a long-term resident myself and you as well, um, we've seen before we had a hub or a shelter or any of that stuff, we had our usual um, degree of that. And it seems like every time that a shelter comes up run by any organization, there's been an influx of, um, well, I'm not sure if the, just, you know, p- people that come in and, and in certain areas is that they're in the crime goes up and the businesses are affected and all of this sort of thing so um you know there's a lot of people in Wetaskiwin who um get really upset with the idea of a homeless shelter because whether because what we've seen in the past and it hasn't worked really well so what are your views on homelessness and um, what do you think Wetaskiwin should ultimately have and is your opinion based on what you think or is it based on what uh, the citizens are telling you so I think over the last three years of since the city started uh, looking after that and ha- and starting the emergency shelter that we did in February of 2019. Um, we were providing a, a very emergent service. It was 35 below. We found a warm place for people to sleep. Um, we, we didn't do it perfectly. We learned from that. One of the biggest things that we learned is that the city is not capable of operating a homeless shelter. So we then contracted that out. Uh, it ran for the next winter. For the most part, it went okay. Again, we learned um, what was going well and what wasn't going well. Obviously the location was was poor. Uh, I called a special council meeting to have that emergency shelter closed early. I think we closed it end of March that year um, because of the issues we were having downtown. So again, we learned some, we learned along the way and we continue to do that. 
uh, bringing an agency in that had a different set of skills that also offered uh, the supports for mental health and addiction, which was something that we were looking for as well. So again, uh, in the beginning, it was working out really, really well. The supports were in place, people were getting help. And then it just kind of snowballed out of control a little bit, not even a little bit, it snowballed out of control. Um, we were having way more problems downtown again. We hired private security. We were we were doing everything that we possibly could to try to keep people feeling as safe as they could in the downtown core. Again, the downtown place was not not suitable at all, but Did it we, was the only location just, that we could have. Just to interrupt really quickly, the yeah. peop, the the crime that was happening downtown. Um, do we know where the people that were where those people were there people being charged with crimes, and do we know if they were local residents uh, with addresses in Wetaskiwin, or were these people coming from other towns? I, I think both. I, there was, uh, yeah. So the RCMP would keep the stats on that. If charges were pressed, obviously those are public. That's public information. Uh, so yeah, for sure. And it it would be a mix. When we had the Nichols report done a few years ago, they identified between forty and fifty homeless people in and around Wetaskiwin on a nightly basis. The hub was seeing between forty and sixty people staying in there a night. So whether they were all from Wetaskiwin or from the region or not. I have no idea. So what determines the term homelessness? And this, again, is just me not knowing. Uh, I apologize because I'm not that smart. I'm not as smart as you. I, I did graduate, but just barely. Sorry. <laughs> uh, that I, home, homelessness can be as simple as couch surfing, not having a safe place to go or a place that that is that is your home, I guess. Uh, somebody who's bouncing from house to house or couch to couch uh, would be classified as someone experiencing homelessness. If you have a home, but you're not safe there and you choose to, uh, to live someplace else or you want to be someplace else, then you would be essentially homeless. All right. And so now talk about your uh, your vision for, for homelessness in Wetaskiwin. I know there's a lot of other issues, addictions and um, a lot of other medications and a lot of other stuff. But yeah. um, go go on however you like to, to talk about Sure. So like you're saying, like we've been around for a long time and we've we've had a, a population of people experiencing homelessness in Wetaskiwin for a long, long time. Um, in my work as a funeral director and on the fire department, I've responded to um, overdoses, um, medical distress being out in the out in the elements and also with a funeral home um, doing transfers of people who have died because they were left exposed out in the elements. So I think that I this, this hits a little bit closer to home with me with my personal experience, trying to find a solution so that we don't have that happening. And I can't tell you over the 17 years that I've been in funeral service, how many overdose calls I've been to where somebody passed away or how many times I've administered Narcan or how many times I've been doing CPR on somebody when a lot of those things I think can be prevented, um, it's just going to take some time. And I know that we have big expectations. Uh, we've got big problems with big expectations and it's not going to be resolved in a few months. It's gonna take some time. If we've got a decades old problem, it's gonna take a few years before we start seeing some change. But what we were doing or when we weren't doing anything and status quo wasn't the answer. And if you want the change to happen within the community and you wanna see a change, um, especially on the south end of the city, because that's where it was predominantly before. So uh, public intoxication, uh, drinking out in public, drug use, and basically just sleeping out in the fields or around businesses or panhandling. None of that was acceptable before, and it's not acceptable now. And it wasn't acceptable when it was downtown. It's just going to take some time to try to find those solutions to lessen that as much as we can. We're never going to get rid of homelessness. We're never going to get rid of the mental health and the addictions, but we can make it better and we can make Wetaskiwin better. And in that, I think it's going to turn it into a safer community. Do you think um, by providing a warming shelter or a, a shelter um, that it could be run in such a way that it doesn't have the concerns of our citizens for crime and violence and, and an increase in stuff? Is, is it possible? Is it just that we just made a bunch of mistakes or how, like, what's the problem? What's the solution? I think, no, I think we just continue to, <laughs> to learn from what wasn't working before. Okay. Uh, we've reached out to a number of agencies. I went, uh, Hope Mission has just, had just built a new building in downtown Edmonton. So they're going to have two buildings up there, one for women and one for men. I got to tour the new facility that I think is going to be for the men. And the CEO up there took me on a tour while it was under construction and talked about all of the, the ways that they do their intake process, 
um, how the building is set up, especially something like that. Like they've been in the business for a long time. So they're able to design that building to look after the, all, the needs of the people working there, the people volunteering there, as well as the people that are utilizing the service. So I think that if we can get some more information from agencies that have been running for a long time, figure out what works for them, decide what's going to work best for us and kind of develop a plan and develop a system that's going to work best for Wetaskiwin. Because if there was one way that was going to fix all of this, somebody would have done it a long time ago because there's people that are way smarter than me working on this and have been for a long time. Right. And it's going to take a, a collective of different agencies working in different ways to find out what's going to work best here in Wetaskiwin. So what do you think the general cons- uh, the general uh, opinion is of a facility like that? Do you think that the majority of Wetaskiwin residents want you to spearhead this and want this to come to Wetaskiwin? Or do you think, to give you an example of why I'm asking, um, when uh, Rock Soup was housing all of those tents, um, they were uh, 600 and some signatures were presented to council with uh, residents who said, we do not want this here. Now, granted, it was not a shelter. It was a illegal encampment which makes uh, sense but if you look at the first time around where there was something trying to be built by the by the mall and everybody was up in arms the churches were up in arms the residents were up in arms um, the businesses were up in arms um, you know the place that it's moved to now behind in Walmart um, of course it's there's no residential close close by and there's uh, the businesses it's kind of the the farthest area of the uh, city where something like that could be. But at the same time, um, I know that there's businesses that are probably not happy that they're there. So how do you how do you juggle or how do you continue on uh, day after day trying for this mandate to or not a mandate, but trying to get this facility or this program set up? Like, why not just give up is my kind of my question. I'm, I'm, I know that we love people and we love to help them. But um, if we don't have a, a, a safe zoned place that we can feel comfortable and safe, you know, what what point do you do you say, hey, this just isn't working, and we just can't have this? And there is bigger communities that have, um, uh, you know, this sort of service, the harm reduction shelters, this kind of stuff, um, in Edmonton. Like, if you go to the Alberta website and you type in "I'm homeless," what do I do? Um, there's only a select number of cities that have shelters like Hope Mission, um, and and it recommends that you travel to those cities to to get that. So, so my question, I guess, is with so many people saying no no, no, no. Um, why are you still saying yes, yes, yes? I guess this my question. And, and it's not that I'm saying yes, yes, yes. We've got an identified problem here in the city of Wetaskiwin. And while I had, I shouldn't say I, while we've had a lot of pushback and a lot of um, signatures for petitions, um, I was getting that plus some from the local businesses when we weren't doing anything. So that's true. Businesses were coming to me prior to the shelter being open in 2019 uh, because there was a loitering, panhandling, public intoxication, public drinking outside of their business. So Walmart was dealing with it. Castle was dealing with it. Canadian Tire was dealing with it. Safeway changed their entrance and exit because they were being stolen from all the time. So while I can appreciate that nobody wants a homeless shelter in their city, doing nothing wasn't the solution either. Uh, For a long time, I would hear um, people not feeling comfortable going to Walmart or going shopping on the south end of the city because they were being asked for money or smokes or and then if they said no, they were getting yelled at. Um, There was a homicide in McDonald's. There was a stabbing in there a number of years ago. Like and there was a stabbing in the Walmart parking lot with a guy leaving. Like So all of these things were happening prior to a shelter or a hub being in place. We've got an issue within the city of Wetaskiwin and if we don't address it, nothing's going to change. And I completely understand why nobody wants a homeless shelter or hub anywhere near them. They don't want to see it. And even while we were dealing with the issues with the hub downtown, I didn't hear one person say, I don't want this service in Wetaskiwin. I just don't want that service there. So there's a need for it. We need to figure out a way to operate it. We need to change what we are doing. Otherwise, the things in the city aren't going to change at all. 
Right on. All right. Well, I think we've uh, gotten through that one. <laughs> I know I added some bonus questions. I'm sorry, Tyler. I, I have to do it, though. So, <laughs> um, All right. Uh, let's talk about our relationship with our neighboring communities. And that could be from Musquatchies to Millet to Camrose, Pinoca, dealing businesses with them. Um, how do you plan on keeping us strong or making our relationship stronger with neighboring communities? Yeah. So that was one of the things that I spoke on in my campaign to run for mayor initially was to build strong relationships with our neighboring communities. And I feel I've done a really good job of that. Um, and so much so that I was elected to the board of AUMA. So I represent cities under 500,000. So not only am I building relationships with our neighboring communities, I'm building relationships across the province. And that includes the provincial and federal government. I get way more minister time with my role with AUMA than I would as a mayor. And building those relationships with other communities uh, I get to reach out to 22 different mayors within the mid-city mayors group that I work with. Um, if I've got questions, I've got concerns, or I'm not sure how to handle something, I've got 22 people that are incredibly smart and have a ton of experience, and I use that every opportunity I get. And so that's no different than me being a person that somebody can reach out to, um, having a, a trying to work on a better relationship with our county, um, same with Millet, working really well with them. Uh, personally, I know a, a few of the councillors from Camro, so that helps. Uh, I used to play ball with Chief Saddleback in, in Muscochise and Samson. Uh, I golf somewhat regularly with the councillor down there as well. So, I mean, building those relationships both professionally and personally is what's going to make the difference on how we build those relationships between our communities. And I think that I've done a really good job of that. And I'm really hoping I get the opportunity to continue that. All right. And speaking of um, uh, truth and reconciliation for a little bit now, um, I know that I, I've seen several um, statements from the mayor's desk that have uh, dealt with truth and reconciliation. Do you plan on continuing that initiative or uh, making it stronger or not stronger, but uh, providing more support? Like what's your plan with uh, truth and reconciliation? Absolutely. So again, I've been building a relationship with Muscochise long before I was a member of council. and I, I plan on continuing that. And then the calls to the action with uh, TRC is something else that I'm going to be working on as well. All right. Good stuff. All right. Uh, let's go to um, talking about the current council. <laughs> um, and you're on current council, so it might be a difficult question to answer, uh, answer on some things. But um, I guess how I wanted to kind of ask this question was, um, if what are you really happy about? What decisions has the council as a group come together on and um, made you really happy they went that decision way? What type of things have they done that have, have really strengthened your um, your leadership and your, uh, yeah, I think you know my question. Go ahead. Yeah. So I think, uh, first of all, it, it started on my first term on council <clears throat> is when we uh, implemented the infrastructure infrastructure surcharge tax. So we built up a reserve of $1.5 million a year. So prior to that, we didn't have, we had a little bit of money that we could put into roads, sidewalks, trails, and kind of replace what we could. And we were so far behind. Our infrastructure deficit was, was brutal. So now we've got a million and a half dollars every year that we can work on things within the city. And I think that that was a, a game changer for the city the overlays and the sidewalks that were built and, and repaired. I'm, I'm really excited about that work and I'm really excited to see how that works over the next few years as we've got millions of dollars going back into the community um, over a two and a half percent increase over, I think just over four years that got us to that million and a half. So that's one of the things that I'm really excited about. Uh, we're starting to build reserves. We've established a couple of good reserves and building reserves to make sure that uh, when we've got some big projects, big capital projects coming up, we don't have to worry about the venturing the, the project. Uh, a good example of that is the new wastewater facility that we need to build. So we're being told by the federal and provincial government that we have to build this. And that's a between a 30 and a $40 million project. Um, and if I had my way 20 or 30 years ago, council of the day started putting money away for things like that. And, and we'd be laughing, we'd have no problem, but we don't. So we've got to figure out a way to, to fund that facility. And I think that one of the things that I want to leave moving forward is building that reserve so that in 20 or 30 years, that next council, when they look to build, I mean, in 20 years, you're gonna to have to probably replace or com like work com on the Manlock Center. There should be a, a reserve set up so that's happening and they don't have to borrow the money to make that happening. So we're not servicing debt 
uh, like we are right now. And that's one of the downfalls I think that we've got as a municipality is just what we're servicing for debt. So not borrowing money to work on projects whenever possible. Um, and again, it goes back to the needs versus wants. We got to fix what we need to get fixed and the wants are just going to have to hold off for a little while. All right. And now let's talk a little bit about what council's getting wrong. And this isn't necessarily <laughs> what, uh, what is, what's, what's been bad, but what have you really wished that would have voted, you know, all in favor, yay, as opposed to all in favor, nay, like what's heart, you know, broken your heart, I guess is kind of a extreme term to use, but where do you think that council, um, what, what would you have liked to have seen, you know, in certain circumstances? I, I think that I can't think of anything offhand that something's broken my heart, but when it comes, when it comes to decisions made by council, I know that when I'm making a decision, I'm making it in the best interest of the city based on the information I have of the day. And I know that the other six members of council are making the best decision they can for the city based on the information they have that day. And whether I, I, I think I've got a goldfish memory in terms of what I got beat on in, in terms of emotion or what I, what I won on or like, none of that stuff is relevant. I know that I've got six other people on council that are working as hard as I am to make sure they're making those those good decisions. And it doesn't matter what decision we make, somebody's going to be unhappy about it. But it, I think as long as, as long as the people know that when we're making a decision, we've got as much information as we possibly can, we ask as many questions as we possibly can, and then we make the best interest, or we make the decision in the best interest of the city. And that, I can say that wholeheartedly, that I, if there's one thing that I take away from my eight years on council or however long I get to serve on council, is that I know that everything that I've done is in the best interest of the city. All right. All right. Moving on to the last section, Tyler. We're almost finished. Uh, we're a little bit over time, but that's okay. <laughs> um, let's talk about, um, uh, we've talked about this a little bit, and I think I know what the answer <laughs> is, but what do you think Wetaskiwin's biggest issue is, and is there a solution to solve it? I think our biggest issue is our crime. And I think that I... I think that our biggest issue is, is crime, and I know that I'm working on that. So with the, uh, the addition of the 10 RCMP members coming to the detachment with that $5.1 million grant, that's going to make a huge difference in our crime rate as we move forward. For sure. And I want to be Canada's highest reduction in crime rate over the next four years. That's my goal. Nice. So Canada's going to look at Wetaskiwin, and we're going to have the highest reduction in crime rate over the next four years. And that's going to come from involvement from the community, the 10 additional members, the extra supports we get from the provincial government in terms of mental health and addiction, uh, justice looking after that as well. All of these things coming together is what's going to make that difference. And so would that be the, your, your vision for Wetaskiwin is to have a safer, much safer community? Is that kind of where you're going with that? Uh, partially. So I think that as we work through that, my and it includes that, is my vision for the community is that we've got people who are, pri are, are proud to live here, they're proud to work here, and they're proud to be from here. And I know you've seen it as, as much as I have, is that somebody posts on social media that they're thinking about moving to Itasquan and they get bombarded with, don't do it, I left, best thing that's ever happened to me. And for, or people that live here and say that, don't move here, I'll, I don't understand how somebody can post something like that and then wonder why our community doesn't grow. Right. So we we definitely have our problems. We've got lots of issues. There is no there is no problem finding an issue within the city of Wetaskiwin. So I encourage everybody else to find some good things about our community and let's start building off of that. All right. And uh, the kind of the last question is kind of like a fairy tale question. If you had unlimited resources and you had a pile of extra money that you had to spend on something, what would you throw it on to Wetaska? What kind of awesome service would you uh, like to see here? Uh, we'd have we'd have no cracks in any of our streets. All of our sidewalks would be perfect. The accessibility on and off the sidewalks would be perfect. Our trail system would be huge. We'd have a, a field house. We'd have a splash park. Uh, we wouldn't be paying taxes, obviously, because we've got all kinds of money and 
we don't need to be collecting property tax. So we'd be living large and we'd be having a lot of fun. All right. Good stuff. I have two other questions that weren't really on your papers that we're going to quickly talk about. Uh, the first one um, is COVID. Do you think the city did um, enough to protect its citizens or, sh or or is doing enough? And do you think that we should um, do, like, say, over and above the provincial uh, restrictions? Wetaskiwin has a higher uh, or a lower vaccination rate than the rest of Alberta. At least it did last time I checked. And is it something that the city should say, you know, we're going to step up and we're going to do, or is following the provincials your best uh, line, but the best uh, choice? I feel following the provincial guidelines is is our best. So when COVID first happened, I feel the city was really strong in coming out. Um, maybe two. I mean, we did things like taking basketball nets off of school parks. I think that was probably a little bit too far. But we're getting into a situation where nobody has any idea what to expect from it. So going a little bit further than what we should have, maybe it helped, maybe it didn't. Hindsight, we'll never be able to, we'll never, we'll never know. So I think as we go forward with this now, we're 18 months into this pandemic, uh, following the provincial regulations, making sure the businesses feel supported, making sure staff are supported, especially within the city and the businesses in Wetaskiwin. Um, and I've been saying this from the beginning of the pandemic, just be kind. I don't understand why if you go into a restaurant or um, the pool or the Manlock Center and they ask you for vaccination, proof of vaccination, because we're part of the restrictions exemption program, and you start yelling at the staff member, you start yelling at the clerk at the grocery store, I assure you they're not the ones making the decisions. If you want to yell at anybody, by all means, call me and yell at me. But don't take it out on staff and don't take it out on people out in the community because you don't agree with what's happening. If, if this is something that the city hasn't done and it's a provincial mandate or something that uh, AHS is telling us that we should do or that we have to do, then I'll give you the contact information for that and you can yell at the right person. But yelling at staff members or yelling at, at grocery store clerks or retail clerks or whoever else is, I feel, really unacceptable. Right. By all means, my, my phone number is on my website. It's on my Facebook page. Give me a call and yell at me, but don't take it out on somebody else. For sure. Um, all right. And then the last question, which is kind of a bonus question, a federal election just went through um, kind of as a repeat of what we just had for the last four years. How do you feel about the results personally? Uh, I, I'm really disappointed that um, a leader felt their popularity was was falling and they called an election and spent over $600 million to, to maintain his government. Um, I think a, a minority government doesn't do anybody a lot of good, regardless of who you voted for. It's another four years of, I hope to do this, or I want to do this, and really not a whole lot of, of work is going to get done, I think. All right. So, Yeah. I'm, I'm disappointed. And so if uh, the last question is, if, if Tyler Gandum's platform was a political party, which political party would it closest resemble? Um, NDP, conservative, liberal, what, uh, what do you think your party represents mostly? The, the wonderful thing about uh, municipal politics is we're nonpartisan. So I, I get to work with whatever government is in power, whether it's provincial or federal, and... <laughs> doesn't matter who it is. When the NDP were the government of the day, I worked with that premier and those ministers. And the UCP is the government of the day. I work with those ministers and that premier. And I'm going to do everything that I possibly can to get the extra supports for our community and for our city um, that I can. Well, that was, a, that was a very political answer, Tyler. I, I, I appreciate <laughs> so, that. It's, something it's, I'm, it's something not, I'm learning. I, something I'm learning is that the squeaky wheel gets the grease <laughs> and I don't mind being the squeaky wheel and I don't mind being the thorn in somebody's side when it comes to making sure that Wetaskiwin gets the supports that it needs. Awesome. All right. Well, that concludes our interview. But before we say goodbye, is there anything that you would just like to, to tell Wetaskiwin? Um, we can ramble on and we have about anything you like. Is there anything that you think you want to get across in closing? I'm, I'm really excited about the election coming up. I hope that the pandemic doesn't uh, keep people away from voting. The city's done everything that they possibly can to make sure that uh, voting goes as easy as possible. We've got a drive through voting going on at one of the fire stations on the east side. Uh, we got special ballots if you're not able to make it in. We've got advanced polling. We've got uh, two locations on the day of election day. If you have any questions about where to vote or how to vote, 
make sure you reach out to me or reach out to any one of the other candidates and they'll be happy to help you out with that. I, our, our turnout is usually pretty low in around 30%. Uh, and if I had a, a wish for that, I'd, I'd like to see something a little bit higher than that. Awesome. So tell everybody the best way to contact you, Tyler, if they have more additional questions, what's the best way they can reach out? Sure. Facebook is Mayor Tyler Gandam. And give me a text or call me on my cell, 780-312-0660. Great. Well, I want to thank you again so much, Tyler, for sitting with me for slightly over an hour tonight and uh, rambling on. I hope that I didn't uh, make you feel too uncomfortable with some of my questioning, but uh, I really appreciate you taking the time today and telling everybody in Wetaskiwin your views and feelings on what I asked you. Thank you. I don't know that I could feel uncomfortable with any of the questions while you have a chicken on your head. I'm, I'm fine. And the, it gives me superpowers, Tyler. It really does. Uh, the chicken on the head, um, you know, like normally when I go to a party or something and I'm pretty reserved, I don't like to talk to people, but I put this on my head, I turn into Superman and I can do anything. So uh, I recommend everybody get one. It's uh, fantastic. <laughs> anyway, you might, have to, you might have to help me out on where you got that. There we go. All right. Thanks, Tyler. I'm going to say goodbye and uh, we'll see everybody on election. Tyler Gandam for mayor. Um, there you go. Thanks, Tyler. Thanks, Scott. Bye, Wetaskiwin. You bet. See ya.